Thank you for tuning in to the World Builders Anvil, episode 248. You want to know how technology spreads? I'll tell you, son, you got to know how ideas spread. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm the Idea Meister, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Authoritatively yours, I am Michael Miller. Wow, I am impressed. <laughs> you always are. I always, uh, you're authoritative. How could I not be impressed? I, okay. I, I demand it. So, was that your phone, Jeff? <laughs> I just, you know, I just quieted mine. I thought I had shut mine off. <laughs> Obviously, I had failed my phone shut off. Well, uh, well Jeff. While, Jeff, while Jeff is failing again, I'm going <laughs> to succeed in sharing big hellos and shout outs to people who have joined the uh, closed Facebook group, the World Builders Anvil Secret Under Croft Fantasy Building. Am I saying that wrong? Uh, basically, but beyond that, just one suggestion. If you join, uh, want to join the fantasy world builders undercroft, that's it. It is pretty much open to everyone, except there are going to be three questions, which can be kind of slow to pop up on your computer. You need to answer those or I give it a little bit of time and then I reject you. If I remember, I will actually, uh, message you, uh, to, to let you know why, but, uh, uh, it's pretty much just to make sure that spammers aren't getting into the group. Yeah, and to get get rid of the bots and people who just, you know, jump into bazillions of groups and whatever. So just answer the questions and you're welcome to join. Um, but a bunch of people have joined lately and I would like to shout them out. So welcome, David, Ashley, Kyle, Wellington. What a cool wow. name. Yeah. Adam, Horace, also super cool name. Sebastian, Sabrina, Guy, and Jesse. Several of those feel like they they are uh, European nobility, I believe. I so think I think most of them are. European. Most of them are European nobility. So if you want to come in, talk about some world building with what we believe are some European nobility, and I don't want to, I don't want to have some great Americans and people from all over the world. I don't want to exclude anyone, but I'm pretty sure they are all European nobility. I, I, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. We also the Emperor of Mars is in the group. So if you want to hang out with the Emperor of Mars, most of the European nobility. How? What? No, all that's different. not. I'm the dictator of Mars, so there's no emperor because I'm the dictator. You've been gone for too long, I guess. Not true. I have a clone <laughs> there. Maybe it's your clone that joined. He just changed the title. Maybe the clone's the emperor. <laughs> yes. Maybe he decided to change. He the, supplanted the, you. The, no, I don't think he supplanted. I think he changed governmental rule. <laughs> Probably trying to consolidate more power. Um, <laughs> we shall instate the first intergalactic empire. Yeah, but uh, actually, speaking of Undercroft, this episode was inspired uh, by Lee and the group who asked the question, has technology spread? And he had a little bit more in there. So this episode does kind of address his answer. Uh, but for me, it's really about how ideas spread and really how people spread. <laughs> So <laughs> smash, just smash your microphone at all, all the time. Just do it again. One more time. <laughs> so professional. I, um, and in the, in the vein of what uh, has happened with Lee throwing ideas at us, if you guys have like a question or an, or an episode idea, you'd love to hear explored by all means, hit us up on the mm -hmm. Undercroft. We have had multiple episodes that have been inspired by or directly suggested by uh, listeners. So or a response or, or, to problems yeah. we hear people have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of times it's stuff that we're all dealing with. It's stuff that we all run into as world builders like, oh, yeah, how does technology go from one place to another? And this one was really perfectly timed. If you don't know me, I'm the kind of person who I over-investigate stuff. I, I like educational content and um, – and also a big history buff. For, I mean, obviously, any listeners are going to know that. But if you're new to the show, big history, buff. big history buff. And uh, I'd like to call myself a steward of his or a student of history because everyone I met who says that usually is not. Um, but <laughs> that aside, I was actually just watching a great course by um, Professor 
uh, Erdwin Barnhart. Actually, I don't know if he's a professor, but he's a PhD. And then another one by Amanda uh, Podne, and I'm mispronouncing all of those names. Um, th- there'll be links to the show notes on, on this episode. I think that's Podani. Podani. I can't read or, it on my glasses. Or Pod Annie. Yeah, either I way, I, I mispronounced it. But there'll be links to like their great courses content, and both of them were very engaging professors. And I watched them on great courses, which is a lecture. Essentially, you're watching lectures. So mm-hmm. you have to kind of enjoy that to really watch it. But it's great evening content, uh, especially when you're getting ready to go to bed because it's interesting enough for you to learn, but not so interesting that you can't fall asleep to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a helpful uh, a helpful balance. But uh, uh, she was talking about Mesopotamia and sort of how it came about and then sort of the life cycle of the, the Mesopotamian cultures. And then he's talking about North American civilizations and essentially how – uh, largely how we've learned through uh, mainly archaeological evidence, they started to piece together. And and so uh, both of them kind of cover uh, these type of topics, sort of how do you get to civilization, uh, also tells you how does technology spread. And because there are three specific time periods we're going to talk about in a really big uh, view of history, and there's pre-localized cultures, there are localized cultures, and then there are. That's kind of when cultures really start to develop uniqueness. Um, you know, very early on, before your cultures localize, you have typically really wide ranging bands of people because they're in search for food all of the time. And if they stay in the same spot, uh, the food typically is not abundant enough in an, enough of the world for them to be able to do that. So they keep on these giant migrations. They typically have the exact same technology. Um, uh, they probably have similar beliefs, uh, at a, but at a very basic level. Uh, there's some interchange when they come together in areas where uh, there's a little bit of excess at a period of time and a couple of bands come together. Not usually a lot of fighting because the risk of losing too many people in your band is, is a great threat to kill off your whole band. So you, you try and avoid conflict when possible. I'm sure it wasn't always. And the interesting thing is at this time, you know, there's no art. There's there's no farming. It's really just it's, it's sustenance surviving with occasional breakthroughs. And then and over you, time. And what would you call a breakthrough at such a basic level? Uh, a new uh, a, a new way to make a spear to take down big game. Um, a new type of food. Um, you know, a new way to process leather into, uh, uh, into clothing, which was a little bit faster than before. Exactly. So I, I, it's simply very sustenance. Your basic, if we, if we, if we chew on it, instead of just spitting on it, we get it done faster. This is kind of when they figure out, like, this is before they figure out, like, you know, how to cook snails without, so you can eat them without getting sick. This is when they're figuring this kind of stuff out. Or they're figuring out this type of wood bins this way and this type of wood bins this way. And some someone goes, you know, if we put those two together and put a string onto it, we'll, we'll have, uh, you know, a bow with three types of wood that can shoot really far. And um, uh, very er- But this is very early in human history, all Stone Age type of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, how to spread fire, um, you know, maybe even how to, even how to burn down certain areas to help encourage regrowth. Uh, how, to, how to spread fire. Doesn't seem like a challenging one to figure out. <laughs> well, it, it is if you don't have fire and you don't know how to do fire, but the oh, idea of how to create fire. Uh, and then to actually use it to your advantage, like if there's an area that you go to and it's starting to get too old, uh, it won't reproduce the ground food that you were maybe used to. Uh, but people start learning that if you burn them down, regrowth will happen. And so the next time you come around, there might be some of those bushes with the berries again. Uh, so all kinds of little weird techniques that kind of lit, lit into Stone Age um, uh, cultures. But really, when you get an, either enough prosperity in the area where there's enough excess food where people – don't have to travel so much, they stop. And they they maintain the same style of um of of style they may, of life of living. Yeah, but they do it in a much smaller area. But the difference is they end up having a lot less contact with other pans. And so at this point, this is kind of when cultures really start to develop and you start to get the ideas of um of uh 
maybe farming starts to come in and, and certain really low level technologies start to leak in at this point. And the cool thing with that is the problem is they're all isolated. So you get the same invention over maybe 50 different parts of the world, figure out how to do something. Um, and the languages also start to separate. Like they could maybe, they had a, a very similar language, but now the sound changes and it evolves differently over time. And you, and you start to get accents and then they break off into new languages. Then over time, you know, uh, culture a and culture b if they would ever meet again even though they came from the same uh hunter gatherers they might not even be able to talk to each other when they first meet because their languages over time will become so different and so but this is also when you start to have a little bit of extra time to where art starts to get created um you know especially you know when you have the the additional food and time you can you can sit around and, and start figuring out how do you make pottery um you know, before maybe you had some baskets that you would weave out of grass, but those would all sort of decay and go away. But when you're stationary, you can have these little bit heavier pots that when you fire them will last for a long time. I know how to do both of those things. <clears throat> no, you don't. I seriously do. I can thatch a basket out of grass and I can make a clay pot and fire it with no tools. So, so can I. Isn't this the same guy who said he would just, you know, go down to the store and buy the knife? Yes. <laughs> okay. Just, just, yeah. just checking in. That's all. <laughs> well, I don't need any of those things to buy the pot, do I? <laughs> no, no. He <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the thing to keep in mind is really you're talking about the spring of ideas is the contact of people. And so you go from a period of time where you have contact with people as the populations grow and their ability to acquire food becomes better and more efficient, you start to lose the contact again. And that's when you start to, to, to get all of your new cultures and races. But now here's the kicker. We're talking about fantasy world building. And so we go back to like one of our favorite topics and you have to look at how magic plays a role in travel and communication in your world. Because if you have uh, magic that is very easy to do, that will allow you to travel or communicate over vast distances very quickly, you don't get the isolation. It, it never occurs. You can, you can communicate with your sister who uh, married off into a different tribe, and then you know about that tribe, and you can keep communicating with them. And so you don't lose um you don't you don't lose that you know when you become what they call localized cultures which are sort of still hunters and gatherers and starting to get into farming but not necessarily but they're 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 good enough at hunting that they don't have to travel so far anymore um and the other thing is too is uh you know a few other things that you really need to think about as you're going through this process is is um, the types of societies that you have once you start getting localized cultures. There's pretty much like three types of societies that we consider their being on earth. And that's agrarian, nomadic, and pastoral. And so agrarian are farmers. Nomadic are sort of like your Mongols. And, um, and pastoral will do some agriculture, but it's typically what they call slash and burn agriculture. And they typically raise animals and those animals, really, the, the main thing they do are move the animals from pasture to pasture. And, um, and then they use the animals as the basis of their food. Um, so some farming, but like I said, typically cutting and slashing farming will tear up an environment. So you can only do it for like so long and then you have to, you have to move to the next pasture. So, um, but they're, they're kind of like in between agrarian and nomadic is kind of the way I think about it in my unsophisticated uh, way. You mean your, your research historian way? My research, yes, yes. That's what, uh, yes, that's what I meant. But the idea is the more agrarian your world is, the more farmers there are, the less need there is to travel. Uh, the uh, nomadic tribes will sometimes uh, bring technologies vast distances quickly because they're on the move and they come around and then they might not raid 
uh, or they might raid. And so you get that new sword that's made out of a different metal and you try and figure out how the hell they did it. Um, or they, you, they might trade goods with you instead of raid you or, or try and take you over. They might trade goods that they've gotten from a different culture further away. And so that will also start facilitating new ideas. Yeah, they'll probably raid you. Uh, Michael and I are hoping for a raid, though. We're all about the raids. You know, and pastoral people, once again, they're kind of in between. But, you know, if you have a lot of nomadic people, you're still going to have a lot of idea shifts happening um, with the people who, who they bump up into. Uh, agrarians become very focused on their location. And when they have excess, they start looking out. Uh, because there's this thing with most cultures, at least most of the ones I've ever looked at, where there's always this need for something different. And that's the way status starts appearing, you know. Like I have glass. And we don't have any glass around us, but the tribe over there does. But I can afford to have the glass made into a necklace. And I have that with me. So I can show off my status because I have this glass uh, necklace and, and no one else does. Ooh, plastic. But, you know, it's one of those things, you know, agrarian societies, until they get to the point where they have a lot of, act, you know, excess goods, typically are more focused on becoming better farmers so that they have more time. And then when they have more time, they go, gee, let's go check that town out and raid it and blow it up. Um, and then you start getting to your agrarian civilizations sort of start to perk up from that point. But also in this localized time where the cultures have separated, this is really when religions are really probably, uh, you're really getting a, enough rituals to go. They're more, they're more than just a couple beliefs that people have. You're starting to get the ritualized things that go along with them um, that are much more common. Um, and to where you'd say you're starting to get religions at this point. And then the religions typically become the foundations of uh, cultural beliefs of people who share the religion typically consider themselves the same people. Uh, even if they don't have the same language, that was like the interesting thing in like Mesopotamia, the Akkadians and Sumerians have the same alphabet, but a different language. Hmm. Um, but the Akkadians consider themselves the same people as the Sumerians. Sumerians were a bit more snobby and, 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 and I don't think they quite had the same view, but I could be wrong. But then again, the Sumerians went away much earlier when the Akkadians conquered them, I believe. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, that happens when you get conquered. <laughs> yeah, it happens when you get conquered. Um, and the other thing you have to think about, too, is how hard is it to d duplicate, right? You know, the interesting thing is that like, agriculture shows up in several places across the world um, with people who have no communication with each other on different types of grains, on different types of vegetables. Um, how... You know, so obviously the idea of spreading agriculture, as, as long as they have enough time to figure out how to plant it, that's all they need. And so if there's enough abundance or the food that they get from it has enough calories to, to feed their caloric intake, um, those are the kinds of areas that will typically develop agriculture faster. Um, but it will, it will, it will co-develop in many different parts of the world over different periods of time, depending on how long they've had to figure it out. It's kind of, it, it's always interesting to me how, what different, um, cultures will eat and what will become, um, you know, a staple in a given, in a given peoples, depending on their location and the way they live. Like there was, uh, something that I was watching recently, it was talking about, it was actually talking about, um, it was a, a book that this guy wrote about historical, um, not, uh, historically imbibing, basically, mm. uh, it, different drugs and alcohols throughout history. Mm. And there was this one that I found very interesting, which was, it was basically a coffee, um, uh, granola, I guess would be a good way to uh, say it. They would mix up these like crushed up um, coffee beans. So there's your, your, your caffeine, your little bit of high there. Mm -hmm. They would crush that up with like, ch like mashed cherries. Mm -hmm. So you nice sweet flavor and like oats and other stuff. But then they would, what they would do is, is they would put it in this like leather pouch and they'd run around with it all day around their neck. Mm. So, so their body sweat and their body heat would heat it up and then it would get 
you know, moist mm-hmm. and it would like kind of bake it into this, like this little mash. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the day, you'd have this tasty little, you know, cherry coffee snack. Yeah. Well, and food's so important too, because to me, the foundations of a culture are food and religion. Uh, and you know, you know, that's really those two things. And then language, I think kind of comes up because they have to, they share the words about what you call that thing. Oh, we call that a tomato, you know, but, uh, you know, there's some really interesting ones. I think it was, I forget who does the, they feed coffee to, I think it's a cow. I forget what animal. And there's maybe even a couple different animals that do No, it's monkeys. And then the monkeys poop it out. No, it's cats. Is it, it's cats. It's, it, it's it's either cats or it's rats. I know exactly what you're trying. It's like a super expensive coffee in South yeah. America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so it's interesting how people like test and why they test certain things. You know, it's, it's a poop. Like, co- it's poop. It's poop coffee. It's like to me, it's like snails are a good one. It's like there's a very rigorous multi day process to 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 prepare a snail to eat so you don't get sick. Um, and you know, or, you know, the person who figured out, well, uh, on, on, on this type of very poisonous blow, uh, puffer fish, uh, you know, how can we prepare the one millimeter of itty bitty? Yeah. <laughs> you know, without dying, Bob, it's your turn. We hope we get it right this time. <laughs> uh, tasty fish, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, you know, so sometimes even when something is, is developed, it doesn't necessarily need to spread to get to another spot, you know, and, you know, and some things will spread really fast and then they won't, it's like the, the most interesting one to me is metal, a uh, metal urgy, you know, processing metal and Eurasia and Africa, you know, when someone figured out how to uh, smelt metal that spread like wildfire. And when they figure out how to smelt a new metal, it would spread like wildfire. In, in, in North America, you know, a lot of times people think the Indians didn't develop how to smelt. They did. There are plenty of copper artifacts, um, you know, from blah, 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 BCE or BC, however you want to say it, you know. But the, the difference was it didn't like – and they were in a trading network with a whole bunch of other people, and their trade goods would show up, you know, uh, the, the copper – the formed copper would show up all over, but the, the other cultures didn't seem, it didn't seem maybe because they didn't develop weapons out of it. Um, I don't know why, but uh, for whatever reason, it didn't spread like wildfire like it did in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Weapons are the best. Weapons usually ensure it. Like, you know, once you develop, develop the weapon that will shatter, um, you know, the existing weapons, People are are encouraged to figure out how to do that very quickly. My, one of my favorites is the uh, Simpsons episode where where they, they they knock everything back to the Stone Age, mm-hmm. and people are running around with sticks. Mm-hmm. And then you got a group of people who come running at, after the people with sticks who have sticks with nails in them with nails in them, and they're like, "Ah, their technology is more advanced." Mm. <laughs> um. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yes, it is. Now, it's just not usually such a remedial difference. <laughs> it's, usually, <laughs> it's usually like, oh, our, our our metal will literally shatter your metal upon you know striking the two against each other. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're gonna win this fight, and then you are going to do your best to figure out how we made these metals. Yeah. Um, after, of course, we pillage your village. After we pillage your village, of course, that's when it always happens. Uh, then you also have to look at too the culture who has the technology, how secretive are they with it? I know for like centuries, China like had very strict laws. They would search people all to protect the silk trade. They want to ensure that their country, you know, uh, maintained a monopoly over the silk trade, which I'm sure like to Korea and Japan, that kind of probably broke down, but especially to the West, a lot of money would flow, uh, flow across the Silk Road to get silk and uh, help make China wealthy and it helped uh, sort of make their, their, their culture sort of dominant in the area that they were in for, for, for millennia. And, um, <laughs> you know, so sometimes it's how secretive they are with it. 
And then two, how hard to, to duplicate. You know, the thing is, you can look at a silk weave, but you can't duplicate it because you can't recreate the silk without silkworms. Maybe the silkworms can't even survive where you are. You know, maybe mm. there's a, a, a plant that you've tasted and love, and so you bring up a whole bunch to plant where you are, but it can't handle the climate where you are, or it's a little too wet or a little too dry to work where you are, so the plant just doesn't do well in your area. Or there's some natural predator, like an like some sort of insect that, that loves the plant that loves you do. Yeah. Or there's an insect that pollinates it that doesn't live near you. Exactly. All kinds of crazy environmental all, factors. All kinds of crazy environmental factors. So how hard to duplicate? And then, you know, um, are there people in the middle and how many problems do they cause? You know, so like the Silk Road, when it was working, worked because there were typically major empires that either came very close to abutting or abutted each other. And for them, it was in their self-interest. Even though they went to war with the neighbor, occasionally the Parthians would still allow trade to happen through them. Now, what they wouldn't do is allow Roman traders to go through to the Han Empire. They, they didn't want to get bypassed because they wanted their cut. So uh, you had to come engage with their traders who acted as middlemen between you and the further away country. But if there's willing participants, uh, and, and, and they can kind of create a uh, road, even though there's probably not a physical road there per se, it will help facilitate trade. Um, you know, but if that middle empire collapses and you have a bunch of uh, nomadic uh, raiders or you have small warlords who attack everything that go past them, it makes the trade <clears throat> break down and the ideas stop spreading to and from. And let's not... Uh really call it a road but let's talk about pathways because yeah. it could be a case where you have um you know like what do you need to live you need water plants mm -hmm. need water you got water you're gonna have food mm -hmm. animals are gonna hang out near water so if you have rivers that tends to be where you know a lot of you know societies and cultures tribes mm -hmm. you know they're, they need a water source yeah so rivers tend to be a good way for technologies to travel if you're in, if you're inland and you've got people moving up and down the river you know consider that if you've got a, a big river in your in your in the continent you're building mm -hmm. that's and, that's going to be where a lot of those technologies move and r roads are something that some civilizations get to um and and it's one of those things that's kind of been figured out in other areas mesoamerica had roads south america had roads the amazon had roads uh, at least in parts of it, uh, way pre in the pre-Columbian period. Um, you, you also have roads, you know, you, people think of the Romans with roads because they were prolific road builders and they conquered so much. There were roads in China, there were roads in Persia, uh, but not everyone did roads. And, 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 and typically pre-roads, roads were rivers, you know. And the problem with roads, though, is ultimately – Roads are a great way to move an army and to facilitate trade. But when you're collapsing and the army is uh, defeated your army and they're marching in your capital, you've now just increased the time for them you know, or decreased the time for them to get to your capital. So, uh, you know, roads are, you know, uh, probably what caused the Persian Empire to collapse so quickly. They would use the roads to move their armies to certain regions very quickly. And then Alexander used the roads to conquer the Persian Empire relatively quickly. Uh, so uh, they are, uh, but they will help facilitate trade. But where do people move? It's it's rivers, um, uh, roads, currents. Uh, there was uh, a Stone Age, I'll call it for lack of a better word, a Silk Road on the ocean. Um, but essentially, there was a culture. It was sort of the proto culture, which led to the Polynesians, that had a unified culture in. Um, in the Indonesian area, and they had like a 3,000 mile trade route uh, that was where the ships would go back and forth and trade with each other. Uh, and so this is like pre civilization times here. This is, you know, um, but a very advanced culture used what they had, which were currents. And the currents worked in such a way where they could utilize them to have, you know, in the Stone Age, long before the Silk Road, something even longer to facilitate trade. 
Um, and then uh, finally, mountain passes, because you can pretty much walk across prairies and rolling hills pretty easily, but you get to uh, mountains, especially certain mountains like, you know, uh, anything surrounding uh, Tibet uh, is a good example, which splits the Silk Road off and helped isolate China for so long, which allowed Eastern, that far Eastern culture to be a lot different than Eurasian culture, um, uh, which developed pretty much in the Middle East and in Europe uh, and North Africa. But the reason they were so different was because the mountains were very isolating. But as people figured out where the passes were and ways to get uh, to and from them, those became less of a burden, even though, I mean, some of these passes are, you know, 10,000 plus meters, up, you know, above uh, sea level. So they become very hard to travel anyway, and very dangerous. So I wouldn't want to have to do that leg of the trade route. Well, you need Sherpas at that point. Uh, but really, that's three things you need. But once again, though, going back to the thing earlier with magic, can you overcome these hurdles easier? Can I teleport there? Uh, do I, can I teleport there without ever been there? Just knowing about it, can I teleport there? If I can do that, I don't need to worry about how people move. I can just boom, appear. You know, I bet if the middlemen go out of whack, who cares? I'm just going to teleport past them, get my goods and teleport back. Problem solved. But then you, you, you can start also adding different things. Maybe there's a magical creature that can follow you in or out of teleportations. So the more you do it, the more likely you are to attract this uh, monster or, or, or the bad guy. Yo, why does it have to be bad? Why couldn't it be just be a unicorn that wants to be like, Oh gosh, another teleporting being hi, and hang out with you. Why couldn't it be a good guy? Have you ever read like, mythological stories about unicorns and then you would call them a good guy That's i'm not saying all well, my argument is that why couldn't the teleporting creature that happens to notice that you can also teleport why does it have to always be bad you're always so negative it always i go bad. for conflict. you want to kill the player i go for conflict because that makes know. things interesting yeah but the conflict could be that there's a bad guy behind that good guy save versus breath weapon what's what no oh, no <laughs> Uh, yeah, but Michael's right. The person teleporting could be the bad guy. Uh, I rolled a thirteen. You fail. Damn. Uh, Hundred d six damage. What? Uh, <laughs> and I probably do have enough dice to roll that. Just counting it would be a problem. Well, how much of that gets through my thaco? <laughs> uh, now. Um, but these are sort of the things I like to think about, and you can get really specific and, and really spend a lot, way too much time thinking about these things. You know, when I'm dealing with the, the spread of ideas, you know, I, I kind of go, okay, for really specific stuff, you know, is there a period of time where they can communicate? Do I feel that? If I do, then the, the technology spreads. If I don't want it to, and there's barriers in the way, uh, then it just, they, they never overcame that obstacle. So thing is you could spend a lot of time really overthinking this and, and developing every tribe, you know, within your world and to figure out what their motivation and what I, I wouldn't do that. I would sit there and, and just go to take out a map. You know, this is my simple solution, right? You take out a map of your game world and you start drawing in things and you kind of go era by era and just sit there and go, okay, this era, things are passing through. This era, things aren't passing through. And just simple borders of where tribes and, and um, you know, where, where contact, civilized contact, I'll put in air quotes because it's not super civilized really, um, not in the way we mean it today at least, uh, where they come into contact and where they play along with each other. But and you know, you, and very you, early, very early techn technologically speaking, pretty sophisticated trade routes will, will start to be set up. And you can use the limitations that we mentioned earlier as to your advantage in your storytelling and in your world building. If you, if there's a certain piece of technology that would kind of undo a setup, a problem, a something in another region in the world, mm -hmm. but that region of the world should absolutely have access to that technology, you could say, well, there's an environmental reason mm -hmm. that that technology can't be utilized here, or there's a magic reason well, that technology cannot be utilized here so that you still have this problem. You know, you could be like, yeah. you know, okay, well, um, 
you know, there, there's these currents in the the ocean over here, so no one can get to the Forbidden Island. Well, it's like, or yeah, you like, can get these to guys the Forbidden are, Island. You well, can. hang on, hang on. I was going to say, like, with, with these guys that are coming up and down river have these longboats, and they could totally handle those currents. Okay, sure, they could handle those currents, but if there's these things in the water that puncture the boat. You know what I mean? Like, you can come up with ways around it so that it's like, okay, fine, you could try the technologies, but you can come up with a way to you know, keep the things that you want to keep the way they are. I think that that's one of the big advantages that that fantasy fiction and science fiction have going for them, where in a real world, it's like, oh, well, there's no real reason why this shouldn't occur because all the te- technologies are available. Mm-hmm. But in science fiction and fantasy, you could be like, oh, well, this is why it doesn't work. And, so, and the great thing is the more fantastical it becomes, the less you have to think about it. You know, if you want it to feel real – think it through, but just war game it out. Right. And do what Michael says, come up with new obstacles, but ultimately most people aren't going to spend enough time evaluating your map and going, uh, that technology is over here, but not here. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I'm so. not a big fan. I'm not a big fan of like, you just said feels real. I don't like that idea. Mm-hmm. I like the idea. Because you're wrong. <laughs> I like the idea of feels or sounds believable. It doesn't have to be real. Well, believable. Yeah. And I think that's what you mean when you mm-hmm. say it. Well, when I say it feels real, I'm saying it's believable. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Faith, and thank you for elaborating. <laughs> All right. So the world building task of the day. Uh, take a map if you don't have a super high technology or a super high uh, magic world and draw out your lines of communication. And so, you know, as you reach space, you start having the same problems over again, right? Like uh, getting to Mars is going to take a little bit longer. So it might be a star chart, but, you know, technologies uh, will spread at the max speed of however fast your ships can travel. So, you know, make a map or a star chart depending on, 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 on your setting and just kind of figure out your lines of communication, you know, where the choke points, you know, like those big mountain ranges that, that get in the way um, and, and just think it out. If you know where your ocean currents are, you know, realize that pretty much unless you have something like the monsoon, which you would in the tropics, it's very hard to go against the current. So uh, if the current goes away from land and doesn't get there, it makes it very hard to utilize. So um, for trade purposes, cause you can only go one way. Um, unless you know where the current turns around and comes all the way back, but then, you know, is there going to be enough time to get around, but just look and, 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 and think it out and just go, these are the, the, the communication things that make sense in my world. And then just run with it, you know, because you can really think of it over time, but realize it's all about people and how they interact with each other. That's ultimately what how information and technology spreads. Um, but now, how, about a re- how about a real world task? Go check out great courses, really. You know, I can't even get an affiliate for them because I live in Connecticut, but I'll put a link to it in the show notes anyway. You know, I, I watch these things just typically before I go to bed, I typically watch one and I kind of like leave it playing and I'll roll over and I'll fall asleep. Um, you know, they're not all perfect. But especially for like history, there's some really good people. Um, and they actually cover all kinds of stuff. You can learn how to do photography in there. You can do all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and basically, any, anything a college, there might be a college course on or a course in a college on, it's going to be in this app. So uh, there's an app you can get on your phone so you can listen to them. Or, uh, and some are audio only as well, I believe. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you get the right professor on a subject that you're interested in, it'll help inform you a lot. And as a world builder, if you need to know a little bit more about architecture, uh, go uh, watch bit pieces of uh, uh, lectures on architecture and how it develops or wait for me to do it. And then I do an episode on it. One of the, <laughs> which well, I'm sure we will. And beyond that, go to the fantasy world builders under Croft closed Facebook group. Come join us. It gives you immediate access to Jeff and I, as well as tons of wonderful people that are into the same stuff as you. All right, folks. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. 
take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike while the mythical's hot.